Welcome to part one of my Plan Your Best Garden series, where I show you step-by-step step how to design a garden from scratch. There are so many people out there who can tell you how to start a garden. I'm taking a different approach. I am starting a brand new garden from scratch this year, and I'm gonna take you along every step of the way. With my 13 years of gardening experience, I hope to help you make this your best garden year ever. And if you're new to gardening, I hope to help make this experience something you're gonna to wanna to repeat year after year. Welcome to the From Scratch Farmhouse. Come learn with us. Part one is gonna cover picking a garden location, planning out your garden design, and ordering seeds and supplies. And no, it's not too late. No matter when you are coming across this video, my answer to when should you start planning a garden is always going to be today. Before I start diving in, I just wanna point out the timestamps in the description. If you are wanting to skip a step or skip to a step, these timestamps will make it easy. Okay, let's dive in. Step one is to pick your location and mark your corners. I'm out in my garden right now, although it's pretty hard to tell. I actually decided on this location in the fall and marked the corners with some fence posts. If the ground is covered in snow where you live, you might be better off placing something like a large rock on the corners so that it's still in the same spot when the snow melts. Okay, here's how I picked this location for my garden. First of all, it is close to the house, and even better, it's close to the mudroom door where I can easily run out there, grab what I need for supper, or bring in the harvest to wash. What you do not want to do is have a garden that you have to hike a ways to. This is what I did in a previous home because I didn't have a choice, so I get that. But if you can, close is best. Second, you want a place that gets as much sun as possible. This location has a very slight southern facing slope, which means that it warms up faster in the spring and stays protected longer from frost in the fall. It also doesn't miss out on any available sunshine. Third, remember that slope I just mentioned? Yeah, it can be a downfall if you have too much of it. We actually plan to come in here in the spring with a tractor and level out the actual garden site a bit. If you are able to, pick a flat location. If not, it may be worth seeing if you can flatten it, or if you're on a really sloped site, create a terraced garden where there are actually steps down to each level. Why does this matter? Well, when you start exposing dirt and then rain comes along, or even just your irrigation system, the soil will begin to erode, taking nutrients, soil, and sometimes even your plants downhill. And it's not pretty, trust me. As you pick your site, you may also be asking yourself, how big should my garden be? There are so many factors that go into this, but I just want to point out that I have had really small gardens that were super productive and really large gardens that were very unproductive. Keeping that in mind, you should be asking yourself these three questions. First of all, are you going to be having a traditional row garden where the plants go directly in the ground, or are you going to be building raised beds? Second, are you just trying to get your feet wet with gardening, or are you trying to grow all of your family's food for a year? Third, do you have a lot of time to commit to this, or do you need a garden that's going to be more low maintenance? Keeping those things in mind, I recommend that raised beds be four feet wide by eight to 12 feet long. And then if you're doing traditional rows, I recommend 30 inches to four feet wide by however long you want. Personally, I'm going to be trying to grow as much food for my family of nine as possible. So I'm going to be doing a combination of both raised beds and traditional garden rows. I'll show you the full design later, but what you need to know right now is that my full footprint for my garden is going to be 52 by 66. Finally, in most climates, you're gonna be needing to think about how you're gonna get water to your garden. Honestly, I almost forgot this one because here in Northern Wisconsin, we don't generally have to irrigate. I know that sounds crazy, but we are not short on water in the summer. For you though, plan out your watering methods so that you know how close you need to be to your water source. Okay, we have picked a location and we have planned the dimensions of our garden. Step two is to plan the outline of your garden and where there will be traditional rows or raised beds. Now I want you to go steal some of your seventh graders graph paper or I'm gonna leave a link in the description so that you can print some offline. You're gonna draw the footprint of your garden to scale and then you're gonna start laying out the spaces for your garden within that footprint. In mine, I knew it would be 52 by 66 feet. So I started by drawing that. Then I began designing spaces within that space for growing versus walkways. Now you may end up tweaking the dimensions of your garden as you go along, 
like I did quite a few times, but that's just fine. Laying out this overall design is still going to be a huge help. Here are some numbers to help you. Raised beds that are only accessible from one side should be no deeper than you can comfortably reach. You can see that mine will be two feet deep. Walkways should be wide enough to get any supplies down, like a garden cart or a wheelbarrow, and just simply to work from. I actually made a wider path around the exterior and then planted make do with smaller paths down the rows. Also, I've made the mistake of thinking I didn't need much of a walkway, which honestly was totally fine, but I forgot that my plants in those rows would get huge and there ended up being zero walkway because the plants grew into it. So keep in mind the dimensions of your mature plants as well. As far as my traditional garden rows and raised beds that can be accessed from both sides, I like those four feet wide. Now I wanna warn you that the go-to size is actually 30 inches wide and four feet does sometimes mean I'm stepping on the row in order to get in there, but I just feel like it maximizes my space. Also, a lot of those 30 inch wide gardeners are using something like machinery to work the beds so it's more important them to have those dimensions. Okay, here's the outline of my garden that I came up with. Once you have yours figured out, make several copies of it while it's still just an outline. Put a few in a safe place for next year even. They will be handy to have. Step three is to plan out what crop, crap. <clears throat> Step three is to plan out what crops you plan to grow and pick the varieties for each. This is the fun part. Now is when you grab yourself a warm cup of coffee or tea and a pile of seed catalogs. Don't have any? That's just fine. Most seed catalogs are available online now, although I have to say it's not quite the same thing. There's just something special about flipping through the real deal. My favorite seed catalogs are Young Seeds and Plants, Territorial Seeds, High Mowing Organic Seeds, Johnny Selected Seeds, and Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. I think I ordered from two or three of them this year. Okay, what I like to do on my first round through the catalogs is to make a list of everything that our family likes to eat. This isn't the time to write down everything you would like to try. You will get horribly overwhelmed, trust me. This list is the things that actually already exist in your meals. This is a list I came up with. Yours might look very different depending on your family's diet. Also, as you go along, keep in mind your garden outline and your space available, but don't trim your list too much at this point because there are some tips to squeeze more into a small space than you may think. On your next time through the catalogs, you're going to write down the varieties that you plan to grow under each crop. Now, in the first round, you could just use any one seed catalog with a good variety, but this time you're going to want to go through a few because different companies sell different varieties. Here are my recommendations. First, find varieties that say they are suited to your location. For example, for me, I'm always looking for ones that say they are good for northern gardeners. Also, for now, stick to varieties that say they have been around for a while. Heirloom varieties are great, but even with hybrids, the description often gives some indication of whether it is a trusted favorite or a new creation. On that topic, let's quickly cover what heirloom versus open pollinated versus GMO actually mean. First of all, hybrid is nothing scary and has nothing to do with GMOs. A hybrid is simply a variety that was created by the intentional, but totally natural, crossing of two different varieties. This is something that happens in nature. For example, if you grow two different kinds of squash next to each other, and then you save those seeds and plant them next year, you're probably going to get some strange looking squash. The intentional crossing of two varieties can create a baby variety that can have the best traits of both parents. Hopefully that makes sense. Here's the downfall of growing hybrid varieties. Let's say you purchase a hybrid variety, then you plant it in your garden, then you save the seeds from that plant. Well, guess what? The plant that grows from those seeds is not going to look like the plant you originally bought. In comparison, an open pollinated variety can be purchased once and seed saved for a continual supply of veggies and seeds without being totally dependent on seed companies. Now I should mention here that seed saving is actually a little harder than it sounds and for that reason, I haven't done much of it. So for me, that isn't a huge reason to stay away from hybrids. However, this year I do plan on starting to seed save and so as I move towards self-sufficiency, I'm also going to be moving towards those open pollinated varieties. Okay, then there's the term heirloom. Heirloom in regards to seeds simply means it is an open pollinated variety that has been around for many generations. 
I absolutely love to hear the history behind heirloom seeds. Okay, so now that we've chatted about those terms that you'll see in a seed catalog, let's chat real briefly about what a GMO actually is. Well, first of all, what you need to know is they aren't very popular or common in home gardening situations. GMOs are expensive to produce, and so they're not usually for the home gardener. They're more produced for commercial growers. All of the companies I buy from don't actually sell GMO seeds, but for reference, GMO seeds are produced by altering the DNA or genetic makeup of the plant, often with completely different species or organisms. There's a lot of debate on whether this is safe or okay, but for me, it's not worth any potential risks. One more note I want to mention. I don't actually recommend that beginner gardeners start their seeds indoors. So you may not actually need seeds for the crops that need an early start in your climate. Here's why. I think that a combination of direct sowing, which is putting your seeds directly in the ground at the correct time, and purchasing starts, which are baby plants, for the crops that need a jump start, is going to be way more manageable and it's going to give you that instant gratification of a planted garden with way less effort. I actually know many seasoned gardeners who have always bought their starts and that is just fine. For me, I actually do plan to start seeds indoors and I don't plan on buying any starts. However, I am 13 years into this. There is many years of gardening ahead for you for you to do that as well. Once you have your crop list and notes of the varieties that you want to grow, I'm going to give you permission to take one more last look through these seed catalogs and see if there's anything you want to grow just for fun. Colorful carrots or fancy tomatoes are always kind of fun. Just don't go overboard or you will get burnt out and may end up wasting money on seeds you never get around to planting. Been there, got the t-shirt. Okay, are you still with me? So we picked a location, planned out our garden outline, and picked the crops and varieties we are interested in. Step four is to plan where each crop will grow in your garden and how many seeds or plants you will need to fill that space. I'm going to encourage you to think of this planning step as more of a game of gardening Sudoku rather than gardening Tetris. Let me explain. You want to first look at where there are holes to be filled, but as you fill those holes, you have to make sure the combination of plants are a go. So here are your garden Sudoku rules, if you will. Number one, taller plants or plants you plan to grow vertically should not be in a place where they will shade other plants. Number two, plants that sprawl should have room to do so. Big bushy plants don't get along well with, say, the tender shoots of dill. Number three, keeping cauliflower, cabbage, and broccoli together will allow you to treat them similarly if you deal with moss, which I think we all do. My recommendation is to actually physically cover these rows with a lightweight netting to keep pesky moths off. So for me, I will have these crops all in one row. If you are doing a raised bed, put them in the same bed. Number four, along those same lines, despite all the hype around companion plants and which plants are beneficial to plant near other ones, I think it is way more practical to instead think about which plants need similar care. If you are completely new to gardening, the easiest way to do this is to group crops that are in the same family together as they generally need similar care. Most notably, peppers and tomatoes don't like to be watered overhead, while peas love it. But don't let this overwhelm you. Some of these things you'll just have to learn with time. Number five, garlic and onions should not be planted with beans or peas. Number six, potatoes don't play well with several crops, so just try to give them their own space. I actually plan to grow mine outside of the garden completely. Okay, I'm going to stop here with the rules because honestly, there's been years when I've pretty much just scattered seeds on the ground and it did just fine. However, if you find this kind of thing interesting, there are plenty of companion planting guides on the internet. As far as figuring out spacing, for larger crops like tomatoes, I will at this point literally draw out on my garden plan the exact placement. Because this isn't super practical for smaller crops that I plan to grow hundreds of, for those, I instead simply calculate the square footage of the space I want to allocate for that particular crop, and then divide that space by the space requirement for each plant. In order to know how much space to give each plant, just Google it. I still don't know most of the spacings off of the top of my head. Most seed companies get this information and it's pretty easy to find. Okay, so here's what this process looks like for bigger plants. I have decided that I can spend a whole 55 foot row on broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. Each of these plants does best with four square feet of growing space. I have also decided to make a pattern of these plants. So just using the grid lines on my paper, I can space these plants out and plan out their exact placements. 
Now, as an example of a smaller crop, I'm gonna show you how I figured out how many onions I'm gonna grow. I have decided that I'm going to allocate four feet by 25 feet for my yellow storage onions, which is a total of 100 square feet of growing space. I've looked it up and it looks like I can grow four per each square foot. Therefore, I can plan on evenly spacing 400 onion plants. That is a lot of onions. Make sure to write down these numbers next to your crop list you made earlier. These numbers will help you purchase the right number of seeds and or the right number of starts when it's time. Whew, that was a lot. I promise we are almost done for the day. There are just a few things left I want you to consider. First of all, if you are a more advanced gardener, you might want to be thinking ahead to what crops you plan to grow in your fall garden. Now, a fall garden is actually planted about midsummer and then harvested in the fall. Now, if your head is spinning, just trying to figure out this whole summer garden thing, just put this idea on the back burner and we will get to it in a later video. Finally, step five is to purchase your seeds and supplies. Go ahead and pick the seed companies that you want to order from and order your seeds. Just make sure to order at least 10% more seeds than you want plants to allow for poor germination or loss. Now, if you'd like to know what kind of gardening supplies you may need, I have created a free downloadable gardening supply checklist and I will leave the link to that below this video. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for joining me here for part one of my Plan Your Best Garden series. In the next video of this series, I will be showing you how I start seeds indoors, as well as my affordable seed starting setup. Then in future videos, I will be getting to the nitty gritty of how to actually go from lawn to garden, soil prep, and so much more. Make sure you hit that like button if you found this at all helpful, and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss my future content. I also make videos on other homesteading related content and creating a handmade home. Happy garden planning!